you have to grab your competition by the throat and you've got to squeeze the life out of your competition. Welcome to a return edition of This Day in History here on the Good Mike Work Channel. I have not done one of these in over a year. I started this series about a year ago, got four of them uploaded, and then just wasn't able to continue the series, so I kind of put it on hold. But here we are a year later, and I decided I wanted to take another shot at giving you guys some of these videos from time to time. So I don't know how frequently I'm going to do these. I would like to do one or two a month in theory. We will see if I get around to doing that many. But either way, I wanted to bring the series back because, as I was staring at the calendar about three weeks ago, and during the production of my WrestleMania Memories commentary, for those of you who have not seen that, there's a link right here on the screen and in the description below. When I was talking about WrestleMania 17, I thought to myself, wow, we're coming up on the 15-year anniversary of WWE's purchase of WCW. So I thought to myself, if I'm ever going to bring back the This Day in History segment, that will be the episode that I do, because I still, to this day, despite the fact that the invasion and the whole WCW takeover immediately went downhill, and it was one of the most fucked up opportunities and ruined chances in professional wrestling history it was still one of the most significant and most influential things to happen in professional wrestling was when wwe finally purchased wcw and then they ran the whole big angle on monday night raw a week before wrestlemania 17 so that's what this episode is going to be about we're going to talk a little bit about the buyout the invasion angle what went right what went wrong some of the circumstances surrounding the purchase of WCW and how it all came to be. You know, it was a very significant day in professional wrestling history. The purchase took place on March 23rd, which was the Friday before the final Nitro. So this episode is going to be focusing on the final WCW Nitro on March 26th, 2001. Still to this day, one of the most surreal nights in wrestling history for me personally because I lived through the Monday Night Wars. I even attended a ton of shows, probably too many to count, during the Attitude Era times and during the Monday Night Wars. Every single Monday night was a very much anticipated time for me. Over the weekend, I would look forward to it. I would actually look forward to going back to work on Monday just so I can come home Monday night and watch WWE Raw and WCW Nitro and flip channels and go back and forth and watch the replay and all this. I had this whole routine every single week. Sometimes I did it by myself. Sometimes I had a friend or two over. It was a very fun time and a very special time in wrestling. Just all those great memories of just experiencing both shows. And WCW would run uh, a replay play because of course TNT is owned by Ted Turner he can do whatever the hell he wants and when WCW got so hot they would run the show again maybe I think they would maybe have like an hour long TNT program in between or something like that but they would end up running Nitro again later on that night so what I would usually do is watch Raw live maybe flipping over to Nitro a couple of times if I knew major shit was going down but otherwise I would watch Raw first and then I would watch WCW later on in the night and then the next day I would call the hotlines and one of which I ran myself for a brief time and I would get the ratings it was just a really interesting and fun time and, and a time that we'll never have again uh, in professional wrestling and after all the bad blood and the exchanges between the two companies and this long war, you know, that only one company was going to survive to see WWE purchase it the way they did. I mean, WCW, I think, in my opinion, deserved to die. They had made so many horrible decisions and done so many fucked up things and so many people ran that company into the ground between the talent and the revolving door of bookers and people in charge. It was an absolute chaotic mess and it deserved to fold. I believe that truly. But when you think about all the people who work there, you know, even the behind the scenes people, the cameramen, the staff, the production crew, all those guys were going to be out of a job. And then three quarters of the roster didn't know if they were going to have a job the next day either. So some of those guys that didn't get to sit on their ass with those big cushy contracts like Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and Goldberg and all those guys, the underneath guys, the mid card talent, the Billy Kidmans, the Rey Mysterios, you know, they were worried what was going to become of them. So in that respect, it was very sad to see WCW close its doors because I have so many memories of the WCW company and the NWA. I grew up on a lot of that shit, so there was a big part of me that was sad to see that all end, but WCW had become such a joke, it was almost like it committed suicide, like it needed to end. You always think about all the what-ifs, and I remember when Eric Bischoff 
was really making a push to purchase the company. He was even on Nitro, I think, over the phone or on the loudspeakers the week before. And he had almost made it sound like they were going to do a relaunching the next week and that he was going to be purchasing the company and that things were going to be changing. But then somewhere in that week, the whole deal fell through. Eric Bischoff tells the story that uh, they were going to let him buy everything, but they weren't going to let him have the TV time. And I guess he just gave up or he lost his investors or something like that. I almost wish that Eric Bischoff would have pursued it a little bit harder because when you hear the stories that Vince McMahon purchased the company for like three or four million dollars or something like that, that's ridiculous. The fact that Eric Bischoff couldn't uh, put together a counter offer or maybe uh, pursue it a little bit more aggressively, I don't know what happened, but Bischoff would have been the perfect guy to purchase that company because a lot of people viewed him as the owner of WCW anyway. He was the figurehead, he was the main guy, so if you had him purchase WCW, then it becomes his own, then that really heats up the rivalry between Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff. And at the time, there was still a pretty intense hatred there between those two guys. You know, Eric Bischoff could have used that as motivation to really try to drive WCW to be a competitor. You know, I think that is one of the biggest what-ifs in wrestling. In my opinion, it might not have made that much of a difference. I think, in my opinion, that is that WCW was too far gone, just way too far gone. They had gotten so shitty. Their talent roster was good. They had good wrestlers on there, but nobody was really over. The crowds had gotten a lot smaller. You know, wrestlers didn't have any any characters. There was just there was just nothing going on. Everything they were doing was falling flat where everything the WWE was doing, they were hitting home runs. So at that point, I think WWE was so far ahead of WCW that there's no way they would have been able to catch up. All of the things that allowed WCW to rise to prominence to begin with was the fact that WWE in 1995 was a very small, family-run company who, you know, had really lost some steam after the steroid trial, had lost a lot of money. They were really going week to week, check to check. They they weren't drawing big crowds. Nobody was even into wrestling at that time, and they were having trouble making ends meet, where in WCW's case, they had Ted Turner greenlining this whole thing they had an unlimited spending potential where they could basically lure anybody they wanted to come over and work for them because back then there was no long-term ironclad contracts so they simply broke out the wallet and raided wwe's talent roster of all the big names everybody that made their names in the 80s the hulk hogan's the big boss man's the hacksaw jim duggan's the honky tonk man's everybody went over to wcw including macho man randy savage leaving wwe with virtually no one for about a solid year and then when more guys contracts came up like kevin nash and scott hall they were able to jump for the big money contract in wcw that would not happen in 2001 if eric bischoff was able to purchase wcw and start his own company He would have to work with the talent that he had there. Now, while that talent is awesome, you had Goldbergs and you still had NWO members around. You had Ric Flair, you know, Jarrett, Booker T. There was some guys there, but not nearly enough to compete with the enormous roster of megastars that the WWE had at that time. Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Kane, The Undertaker, Triple H, Edge, Christian, you name it. They had so many huge stars there that there was no way WCW or anybody else would be able to catch up. And Eric Bischoff would not be able to buy any of the WWE stars like they did in 1995. That was my biggest argument years ago, part of the reason why I started doing commentaries to begin with nearly six years ago to the day was because there was a portion of the wrestling audience out there that I saw on YouTube that 100, 1 million percent believed in their hearts that not only would TNA be the number one wrestling promotion and WWE would be number two within five years, but that the WWE would be completely out of business. And I was flabbergasted that some people out there actually thought that. It's one thing if you want to be a fan of TNA, but don't bullshit yourself. you got to be out of your mind. That very idea and that very concept is impossible. It cannot happen. WWE is 10 times bigger than they were in 1995 when they fell victim to a better company with more money and better ideas in WCW. That would never happen with TNA now. They are financially inferior to the WWE. They don't have enough money to lure somebody away and say, okay, when your contract's up, we will pay you more. They can't do that. The quality of the in-ring work in TNA was fantastic. It always had been, but that was not going to be enough to become the number one wrestling company, and I just thought that fans were being incredibly naive. I know that something like that cannot happen. The best we can hope for is that TNA 
just becomes competition for WWE because that's what WWE needs. They need some good, strong competition. But this idea that WWE is going to be out of business, are you fucking kidding me? If Ted Turner's wallet in 1995 couldn't put this small-time company out of business, then there's no way a company in 2005 is going to be able to do that to the mega machine that WWE has become that is now at least 10 times bigger than it was in 1995. They had grown too big, their claws were sunk in too deep, and there was no getting them out. And I think if WCW would have continued on with another owner, they would have eventually have suffered the same fate. It would have been nice to see them give it a shot because they would have still kept the WCW name, the WCW tape library, and all of their history. They could have really probably ran for a few more years, definitely, and still been competition to WWE. But unless things went drastically downhill morale-wise in the WWE, you weren't going to see guys like Kane and Edge and Christian probably jumping ship because if they did, they wouldn't even be able to be those characters. They would have to be repackaged, and we've seen what WCW does when they have a great star in their hands. Most of the time, they don't know what the hell to do with those guys. So I think a lot of the WWE guys probably would have realized that they would have been better protected in the WWE. So there's just no way they would have been able to compete with the WWE on that level. Now, like I said, that's just my opinion, but it still would have been a lot of fun to see Eric Bischoff give it a shot. If he was able to land a TV deal somewhere else and WCW just had to, I don't know, maybe go off air for a few weeks, maybe a month, while they got their shit together and got a new TV project, then they were able to relaunch Nitro, maybe with uh, a new set and a new look and on a new channel and all this shit. You know, it definitely could have... uh, Definitely could have been competition to the WWE easily. But like I said, as far as them becoming number one and and the whole war starting over again and then WWE eventually dying, there's no way that would have happened by this point. WWE had already grown too big on the success of the Attitude Era and The Rock and Stone Cold and everything that they were doing. And I remember at the time still being excited because, like I said, with that final Nitro... You know, they were hyping up that Vince McMahon had bought the company. They were playing Raw on the big screen on Nitro and vice versa in WWE. And then they did that great segment with Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon. And here we are just days away from WrestleMania 32, 15 years later. And these two guys, this father-son combination, are still involved in a major WrestleMania match and storyline together, just like they were in 2001. They had already built up a ton of heat for this father-son match at WrestleMania. This WCW shit was just the icing on the cake. So, of course, Vince McMahon comes out on Nitro and Raw and announces to the world that he purchased WCW, and he's going to tell everybody later on what he's going to do. And when he comes out to the ring for that segment, I mean... Man, it was just still so surreal the way he was name-dropping all the WCW guys. Vince McMahon barely even said the word WCW before. Now he's talking about Goldberg and Scott Steiner and Booker T, and he's actually naming WCW roster members, even in the backstage area. Remember when he fired Jeff Jarrett? I mean, they're looking at the monitor. I think it's like Jarrett and Luger are backstage, and both of those guys have some heat with Vince McMahon the way they left the company, Luger in 1995 on that opening Nitro. And then Jeff Jarrett, what he did in 1999 when he dropped the belt to China and everything. Vince hated those two guys, and he basically fired them right there live on Monday Night Raw. Part of me thought that was a little bit fucked up. Part of me thought it was really awesome. And then he's out there in the ring for the big simulcast, which I believe was the final segment on Nitro, but Raw still had another hour to go. And he's name-dropping everybody and all that, like I said, and then he says that AOL Time Warner wants him to buy WCW, and he has agreed to purchase the company, but he won't sign the papers until WrestleMania, until Ted Turner himself walks down to the ring and sells him the company on WrestleMania. And then you hear the No Chance in Hell music hit, and Vince is kind of looking around all confused, and then up on the Titantron, you see Shane McMahon walking out on WCW Nitro. I mean, the very fact that a McMahon was standing in a WCW ring to this day blows my fucking mind. You know, just to see Shane in there with the WCW Nitro logo and his name and holding a WCW mic in that ring, to me, you know, is just still one of the most surreal things I've ever seen. I don't know if people who weren't around during the Attitude Era or maybe weren't old enough or weren't even watching wrestling at all during the Monday Night Wars and during that time, you know, how that feels to someone like us to see that. You know, to a fan now, they probably don't even think it's a big deal at all, but you just have to understand how intense that war and that rivalry was. Hell, look on the WWE Network. One of my favorite shows on the WWE Network is that Monday Night Wars show. 
that they launched right, I think, when the network started. I mean, those are great. Here we are 15 years later, and I am still fascinated by the Monday Night War because it was just such an incredibly special time in, in wrestling. And like I said earlier, one that we'll never have again. And we thought it might continue. We still thought we would get that competition because when Shane announced that he had purchased WCW out from underneath his father and he was now the owner of WCW, I in a way liked that. I loved that fact. I would have liked if they kept it real. What if it wasn't kayfabe? What if it was actually real? What if Vince McMahon said, okay, Shane, you now own WCW for real, in real life. It's your company. Do what you want with it. And we'll maintain a working relationship and maybe we can create some competition. Good luck. I mean, I think they should have gone all out with it. Shane should have purchased his own uh, company headquarters and made his own building and his own separate WCW headquarters and brand and identity and all of that. And the two McMahons could have owned the professional wrestling world. Imagine if they would have done that. Shane would be responsible for going out and finding his own TV deal. He wouldn't be able to piggyback off the WWE and USA Network or anything else they were doing or UPN or wherever the fuck SmackDown was playing at the time. If he literally had to go off on his own and try to make this company something, it might have been a fun challenge for Shane McMahon. That might have been kind of fun to watch uh, an experience take place. But, you know, in storyline, Shane buys WCW. And uh, from what I understand, WWE did have plans to relaunch WCW. A lot of people trace... Uh, back the match uh, of Booker T and Buff Bagwell on Monday Night Raw to the night that Vince McMahon just decided, nope, we're not going to do that anymore because the match was so horrible. WWE wasn't able to bring in any of the big-name stars and to have Booker T versus Buff Bagwell as your first WCW match they gave, like, the final segment on Raw to WCW. They even had the announcers come out. Scott Hudson and, I think, Arn Anderson uh, was who they chose to do commentary. Paul Heyman and Jim Ross had left the commentary booth, and they were going to call the main event. I can't remember if it was a title match or not. But it was just a really terrible match compared to what WWE's roster members are doing out there. This match between Booker T and Buff Bagwell was horrible. Booker T was awesome. I've always hated Buff Bagwell. I've always thought he was an idiot. So the fact that he stunk up the joint didn't really surprise me. I just wish Booker T would have had somebody better to work with. And uh, the story goes that that match made Vince McMahon so mad that, you know, he just decided that whatever their plans were for WCW was no longer going to be taking place. I wish they wouldn't have given up that easily or tried again or given, uh, I don't know, some cruiserweight guys a match or maybe just anybody else other than Buff Bagwell out there with Booker T could have been a big help or at least wait until, you know, don't debut any WCW guys and don't start the invasion until you know you're going to have enough talent to make the storyline credible. That's always been one of the biggest issues among wrestling fans is like, shit, WWE, why didn't you do anything to get Ric Flair or Goldberg or Nash or Hall or Hogan or Sting or anybody like that sooner? And the answer to that was a lot of those guys were sitting at home with big contracts because they still had to be paid. Whether WWE bought out the company or not, they still had to be paid those big money contracts and AOL Time Warner was going to be honoring those contracts for the duration of of that time. So those guys were going to be getting paid. So they could either accept a buyout for a lot less money, most likely, or WWE would have to match the offer or pay them more for them to come in. Now that's a two-way street. I've talked about this subject before. And a lot of people think the nice, easy, quick answer is like, yeah, WWE, if you just would have paid these guys and brought in some big talent, that could have made the storyline so much better. You're right. It would have. It would have made the storyline awesome. Imagine if you had Goldberg there. Imagine if you had NWO guys there, even Ric Flair, who didn't come in until the night after the invasion angle ended. If you had anybody like that in there, uh, what was the shoot interview? Uh, it's up in my Easter egg. It was the Jim Cornette uh, rebooks the invasion or something. Some of the ideas he had were fucking great. You know, having Ric Flair and Eric Bischoff come in and all of that, because that's who WCW was. That's who the fans associated WCW with. Not with Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare and Stan Stasiak and all these fucking guys. They weren't the face of WCW. They were the face of this new shitty WCW that we saw right before they died. You know, you got to bring some WCW names, some mainstays out there to go up against this huge WWE roster. Otherwise, it's not going to be much of a fight. 
But let's say they did that. And this is what I've talked about before. Back then, you always hear the WWE guys in shoot interviews on, on DVDs. They always talk about that during the Monday Night Wars, the WWE had a much more solid locker room than WCW. WCW was the place with the bad morale because everybody was being paid a shit ton of money for doing no work at all. They were lazy. Nobody was in charge. Nobody gave a fuck. All they wanted was their paycheck. Where in WWE... It was more of a team effort. You were fighting for your own roster spot and your own opportunity, but really you were also against WCW, and there was just a lot of camaraderie, and the morale was very high. You had locker room leaders back there, like The Undertaker. You had an unbelievable field of agents and backstage people that had a ton of knowledge. You know, all the McMahons. You got Pat Patterson, Michael Hayes, some pretty smart TV writers at the time, guys like Vince Russo, who, under the filter of Vince McMahon, could come up with some pretty fun and entertaining ideas when he wanted to. It was just all around a much better work environment at that time. Maybe not so much today, but definitely at that time in 2001, morale and the the camaraderie and respect amongst the talent was sky high. So if you were to bring in a bunch of guys, you know, even if it was just one or two, I think one or two names would have definitely helped and was necessary. And if you explained that to the WWE talent roster and made them understand that, yes, what we're paying these guys might seem absurd, but it it's what has to be done in order to make this storyline better and have all of us make more money at the end of the day. So if they were all on board with that, then I think it would be fine. But you got to look at it from their point of view. A lot of these young, hungry talents, the Hardys, Edge and Christian, guys like that who have been busting their ass on that roster night after night, working every house show, every pay-per-view, killing themselves during a very violent and aggressive and stiff style of competition back then during the Attitude Era. And, you know, they're going to be now making less money than someone someone that's coming in just to make appearances and part-time because if they brought in Goldberg and brought in Flair during the invasion angle when it started it's not like these guys are going to be working house shows it's not like they're going to be on the road working the loops because they're not supposed to be on the main roster working matches so they would essentially be being paid all of this money just to appear on some raws and smackdowns and pay-per-views and maybe an occasional run-in until the wwe figured out what they wanted to do and if these guys ever started getting in the ring and working uh matches on a regular basis otherwise it might ruffle some feathers in your locker room It all goes back to that what's best for business thing, and if WWE would have thrown a few bucks at these guys to make the invasion better, it definitely would have been best for business. But would you you have been able to get your talent roster to understand that and to get on board with it, especially when everybody is working so hard for their opportunity? They don't like to see shit just given to guys, at least back then. So I think the idea of WWE just throwing enough money at certain guys that they would buy off their contracts and come to work for the WWE is a very easy answer, but if you analyze it a little more deeply, it might not have been possible. So in that case, WWE should have waited. You know, I think they could have still waited a year because after a year, everybody was there. By then, Hogan and Hall and Nash and Flair and a year after that, Goldberg. I mean, everybody had come in by that point. I think WCW still could have made an impact if you waited a full year to even start the invasion and then start it in 2002. Because even on the WWE side during the invasion, you didn't have Triple H. He would have been very interesting to see in the invasion storyline. You didn't have Chris Benoit, who was also on the shelf with an injury. He had, of course, jumped ship from WCW as a member of the Radicals. And now to be on the other side of that, you know, invasion storyline would have been pretty awesome to see. Hell, I don't even think we had Eddie Guerrero, did we? Wasn't Guerrero briefly fired during that time, too? So you were missing a lot of guys that would have been fun to see involved in that invasion storyline. So if they would have waited a full year, you know, it might have gone a lot better. So hindsight is twenty twenty, but it's pretty ironic looking back on this final Nitro and the night that they did the big angle with Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon. That night and that crowd reaction and the buzz in the wrestling world could not have gotten any bigger. Here you are six days away from what still ranks up there as one of the best WrestleManias of all time with a mega main event of Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. And then this WCW storyline breaks just a week before on the go-home Raw, and they now have a whole brand new angle and a huge bombshell in the wrestling world that has been dropped on a bunch of wrestling fans that are probably already overstimulated and on sensory overload just because of the overall excitement that WrestleMania 17, just a mere days away, 
It amazes me looking back that literally immediately after this moment in this great Monday Night Raw that it was so downhill so quickly. I mean, hell, even Shane McMahon and Vince had swapped. I mean, Shane was the babyface on this night when he showed up on Nitro and the babyface in his match with Vince at WrestleMania 17. But as the invasion began, Shane McMahon turned in to the old Shane McMahon, the old cowardly heel, and Vince McMahon kind of rose to be the babyface because that's what WWE has always taught their wrestling fans to believe is that WWE is the good guys and everything about WCW is evil which is probably another reason why WCW didn't work out so well is because the fans WWE hardcore fans were going to reject WCW hell even I did I couldn't stand Monday Night Nitro but I watched it anyway and I tried to put my personal feelings aside to appreciate good professional wrestling because there was some really great wrestling on WCW programming, but the company had pissed me off so much, and WWE had taught us to think a certain way. I was I was pro WWE. I was way more of a WWE guy than I was a WCW guy. And even though I watched WCW, I always watched it with a scowl on my face, like I'd get pissed off when they would do shit. And I've always thought of myself as a pretty objective and unbiased thinker. So if even I'm thinking like that, you got to think about what all the crazy, you know, salivating diehard WWE fans must be thinking about WCW. And of course, they were going to reject that product and that company and anybody that worked there. Which is probably why they booed the shit out of Buff Bagwell and Booker T that night on Monday Night Raw. Because they wanted to see Kane and The Rock and Stone Cold and Triple H and everybody else that was awesome. Not these two shitty WCW wrestlers. I mean, the fans did like Booker T and they respected him and he would turn out to be a great WWE wrestler as well. But a guy like Buff Bagwell, get him the fuck off of our Raw. Looking back, it's so amazing that this is 15 years ago. I mean, shit, the years are just flying by. I mean, these memories to me are still so vivid. I remember so many details about the Monday Night Wars and Raw and Nitro and the Attitude Era and everything that went on back then. I mean, I just have the most uh, vivid, small details. I remember the little things. I just remember everything that went on back then. And to me, it still doesn't seem like it was that long ago. So it's definitely one of the most significant nights when you look back in the history of professional wrestling in general, some of the major events to take place. This night on Monday Night Raw, March 26, 2001, was one of the biggest things to ever happen. And we have not even come close to replicating the competition that WCW gave to WWE. And like I said, we will probably never, ever see it again. So I hope you enjoyed that little ramble fest. I thought that the purchase of WCW and the final Nitro would be an appropriate uh, subject to do for a returning segment of This Day in History. So I will try to be up here in a couple of weeks with another one of these and try to give them to you a little bit more frequently from now on. Thanks again for listening and leave me all your comments and thoughts and memories and opinions of the Monday Night Wars and WWE buying WCW, what went right, what went wrong, what you agreed with me about, and what you disagreed with me about. Let me know all of it. I will catch you guys again in just a few days. Until next time, peace.